there'll be many memories of Watford's 1997-98 season and those memories will be of moments of magic day one of the season and a home game against Burnley was to turn out to be the first leg on the championship road we weren't to know it at the time as Jason Lee one of the new boys who'd been signed by Graham Taylor back in charge of team affairs at Vicarage Road from that Tommy Mooney cross put Watford 1-0 into the lead and there were more chances in the second half new boy Peter Kennedy's corner and a fine save from a Tommy Mooney header Watford won 1-0 and in good heart was set up for two away days Kennedy again with a free kick and Gifton Noel Williams following up to put them 1-0 up against Swindon Town this in a Coca-Cola Cup tie with Watford having to spend much of the game with 10 men after Jason Lee was sent off Alec Chamberlain's early heroics provided crucial opportunities for Watford to test their defensive skills and it fell for Ronnie Rosenthal making his debut to give Watford a second goal as they went to Carlisle the longest away trip of the season four days later and once again secured a 2-0 victory Peter Kennedy providing the first as Graham Taylor's men finally cut loose in the closing stages Kennedy's goal a splendid one this though even better Richard Johnson's long-range thunderbolt and the ball Carlisle keeper helpless a 2-0 win the perfect start to the season back home against Brentford and a first half of pulsating football highlighted by Keith Millen scoring the first goal against his old club the delight on the face of the centre half clear for all to see but Watford were only just beginning Lars Melvank came in for his first goal in a Hornet shirt during a trial that was ultimately to prove unsuccessful but he too exploited the weaknesses in the Brentford defence Rosenthal went on the charge Carl Hutchings brought him down and referee Bennett said penalty however much Kevin Dearden the Brentford goalkeeper protested and he made amends for it when saving Stuart Slater's spot kick Jamie Bates completing the clearance into the second half and Brentford got themselves a penalty of their own pushing in the box said the referee and Brentford starting a fight back that did cause just for a moment or two alarm amongst the Watford faithful but that was to be silenced in the most spectacular style Richard Johnson at the help yourself counter and coming away with a basketful with another right-footed sizzler and the home leg against Swindon another good performance by Watford with Micah Hyde getting his first goal in a Watford shirt after Stuart Slater gentleman as ever said after you with the goal wide open in the second half Swindon did get themselves one goal back but on aggregate although the game was drawn on the night it was Watford who went into the next round and so to the end of that proud unbeaten record and it was a former Luton man, Kurt Nogan, that did the damage at Deepdale. Graham Taylor less than pleased with the way his side hadn't taken any of their opportunities. Nogan with a goal in each half. And Watford's record in Lancashire, not the best that they have, it didn't improve on a sunny Deepdale afternoon. A second away trip in four days took Watford to Devon. In the rain, they left it late at home park. John Sheffield, who'd been on loan at Watford, could only parry Peter Kennedy's free kick. And it fell for Gifton Noel Williams to grab a late winner. In a game played 24 hours later, as the country mourned Princess Diana, Watford took on Wickham in front of chairman Elton John. Micah Hyde got an early goal. And in the second half, Jason Lee's goal was to provide the main talking point. A stunningly powerful volley from a knockback by Ronnie Rosenthal. Makes you wonder where the ball would have finished 
if there hadn't been a net in the way. The closing stages saw a Wickham rally and they got themselves one back through Paul Reid. The points were the Hornets. And so to the visit of Chesterfield, who'd also made a very good start to the season. Peter Kennedy supplied the cross, Jason Lee, and it fell to Ronnie Rosenthal to have his first home goal of the season acclaimed by the Vicarage Road faithful. In the second half, Tommy Mooney's cross, a glorious Jason Lee header. The goalkeeper reflecting where had all the marking gone. Lee didn't care. It was the classic centre-forward goal. Chesterfield having to rely on Watford old boy Harry Willis, looping header late in the game. It was but scant consolation. Watford's home record looking more and more formidable. And three more points. To Sheffield United in the second round of the Coca-Cola Cup. And Scott put Sheffield United in front. Many left for home early, missing a moment of pure genius from Peter Kennedy, which squared it at 1-1. The least the Hornets deserved for their efforts it was one of the many moments of real skill by Kennedy. So to the bruising battle of Gillingham. Controversial it was, as Watford had some early chances, but Gillingham were to take the lead with a goal by Matt Bryant as he climbed above the Watford defence. Shortly after half-time, the first moment, Ronnie Rosenthal went down, the referee said penalty, up stepped Rosenthal, 1-1. Gillingham had a number of Watford old boys in their team. Akinbae fed one of them, Steve Butler, and it was back to 2-1, as Watford then found themselves having to play the last few minutes with 10 men, Jason Lee sent off for the second time in the season for his second yellow card and just as it seemed as though the points were staying in Kent cometh Mr Johnson cometh the back of the net another screamer by the popular Australian 2-2 and Watford had a share of the spoils The return at Sheffield United was to turn out to be a desperately disappointing evening and it all hung on the first goal. Chris Day in for Alec Chamberlain. The referee said no foul, awarded the goal and it all went downhill from there. Dane Whitehouse in midfield was in commanding form and there was nothing that they could do as Sheffield United cut loose en route to a commanding and flattering victory. One of those nights, perhaps, but at least it gave Watford the chance to concentrate on their number one target, amassing league points in a promotion charge. Whitehouse got two goals. Brian Dean got one. And United rampant in the end five one on aggregate to the blades of Sheffield and four days later York City arrived at Vicarage Road a ground where they'd lost 4-0 the previous April but this was a very determined York City against the less than perfect Watford and the visitors deservedly a goal up at half time in the second half Lee split the attack through the middle and as the defenders tried to get the ball away Lee would have had a penalty the referee confirmed afterwards if the ball hadn't ended in the back of the net it was an equaliser and it was next stop Luton his free kick towards uh, the advancing figure of Rosenthal now Johnson good try and Davis looks in despair and Johnson that is free kick again the players Thomas is uh, ready to run onto this one just past that post and this powerful start Slater 
now Kennedy Thomas has got there between the two defenders Thomas 2-0 what a start for the Hornets and he'd have had your shirt on him doing something there target is Kennedy Thomas tried second attempt by Millen third by Kennedy what a strike by the Ulsterman they're trying to build it but they've lost it to Kennedy now can he do something with this beautifully cut inside right footed four 32 minutes gone a 10 day break followed that famous afternoon before a trip to the memorial grounds where after a tedious first half in the rain the second produced some great moments Peter Kennedy again in the right place at the right time and Watford ahead by a goal to nil the chances started to arrive Rosenthal on the charge the young goalkeeper adjudged to have brought him down referee Dean deciding that a yellow card would suffice and Rosenthal making it 2-0 but not for the first time there were to be just a few anxious moments in the final stages Rovers with both Beadle and Penrice anxious to do well against their old team and Penrice getting one back but Watford held on and next it was Millwall at Vicarage Road Paul Shaw's goal the first home defeat of the season for Graham Taylor's men a first half strike by the ex-Arsenal man and enough to continue the amazing sequence of away teams in that fixture Fulham's visit to Vicarage Road four days later hoisted the business as usual signs a great goal by Ronnie Rosenthal got the show on the road and right at the end the second goal and a first for Paul Robinson that wrapped it up Watford back on song latecomers missed it all at Blundell Park just 33 seconds and Ronnie Rosenthal breached the Mariners defences for the only goal some of the best football though came against Blackpool in early November Jason Lee getting the first beating Banks to the cross and this was the sign for Watford to play with tremendous confidence in the second half a Kennedy corner and Jason Lee unmarked 2-0 Banks' frustration obvious Watford's delight equally so and then a fine Jason Lee run and Richard Johnson a rare goal from inside the area another magical moment great approach work and a splendid finish but on the day when young Dean Rosenthal was named amongst the mascots the old man showed him how to do it a wonderful Maisie run a glorious chip over the keeper and the fourth Watford goal one that would have graced a much higher stage Blackpool did get one back late on slightly disappointing that Watford couldn't keep a clean sheet as Priest got the header it was a mere consolation and so to South End Peter Kennedy his finest hour playing as a centre forward the first goal a right footed one and the first leg of what Graham Taylor was to describe as a quite superb hat trick the second this free kick the smile on Kenny Jackett's face after that said it all the delight of every Watford supporter and every Watford player following this gorgeous chip to make it three 
No wonder the match ball meant so much to him. From South End up the M6 to the Beskers at Walsall. Again, Kennedy feeding Gifton Noel Williams. His shot agonisingly wide on what was not one of Watford's better days. Rosenthal, Noel Williams, great piece of clearance by the Walsall defender when a goal seemed almost certain from that Noel Williams effort. And then the cup at Barnet. Ken Charlery, five yards out against his old club. 1-0 to the third division side in the first all Hertfordshire derby between the two teams. A professional level. The equaliser, Johnson's cross, Ronnie Rosenthal and Jason Lee celebrate. It turned the game on its head and Watford went on to win it with Rosenthal in the clear. They got themselves out of jail perhaps, but Rosenthal at the second attempt, despite the fine save first time round from Harrison, put enough power on the shot to send Watford to round two. The visit of Oldham three days later and a fine early start, Di Thomas providing the first goal. An important night for the Welshman who knew he had the chance of improving his prospects of first team football. The Oldham equaliser though was a bitter pill to swallow. It looked as though it was enough to give the Lancastrians a point. But they'd reckoned without Mr Thomas Mooney. Players jokingly described it as a shank, but one of the most popular players of the modern era at Watford had other ideas. On the subject of popularity, Peter Kennedy's goal scoring had made him an instant hit. And that goal, on a day when Watford were desperately short of front players, was enough to win the game at Northampton. And Watford, on a roll, then took on Wigan Athletic at Vicarage Road. With a real chance of making it a very good November. And they were given a rude awakening. Wigan took the lead. It was Graham Jones who scored it. But that seemed to rouse Watford. Rosenthal, Hyde. And in the back of the net, as quick as a flash by the delighted Di Thomas, the equaliser. Kennedy's corner, Thomas headed it on. The final touch, well, was it Tommy Mooney? Was it an own goal? It was there anyway. Watford won 2-1. And headed as the games continued to come thick and fast to North Wales and for a match against Wrexham, where Ronnie Rosenthal gave them the lead. The race course hadn't been a happy hunting ground the previous season. But Rosenthal's goal looked to have been enough until deep in stoppage time. Wrexham throwing players forward in a desperate search for an equaliser. Finally hit lucky. Did the fullback mean that to be a cross? Did he mean it as a shot? He didn't really care. His equaliser, 1-1. And Watford were on their travels to Torquay where Gifton Noel Williams ended a long barren spell with the first goal against the third division side. But they're made of stern stuff. Gibbs equalising for Torquay United. That forced a replay, which had to wait as Watford went to Fulham in the auto windscreen shield. Paul Moody got the goal. It was to end Watford's Wembley dreams in that competition. Before the top of the table clash with Bristol City. Packed Vicarage Road. Gota right the way through past the despairing Alec Chamberlain. City in front. The equaliser came late. Gifton Noel Williams. Having had a long spell when he couldn't score suddenly found he had a spell when he couldn't do anything else 
the substitution had worked and Graham Taylor and John Ward went out to dinner happy their teams had drawn the return of Torquay and a goalless first 90 minutes although Watford came very close particularly with Richard Johnson and then Jason Lee missing the target from the rebound but seconds into extra time the deadlock was broken Kennedy fed Noel Williams Noel Williams helped himself and Watford ahead by one goal to nil but the match still had another twist veteran midfielder Gary Clayton's splendid free kick level at 1-1 was it to be penalties to decide who played Sheffield Wednesday if to know Williams had other ideas Peter Kennedy fed the number seven how about that for a finish to book yourself a place in the FA Cup third round one of their best performances away from home was the Saturday before Christmas Peter Kennedy's free kick not for the first time enough to win the points but this was Watford at their most determined setting up a Christmas programme on high spirits at Wickham on Boxing Day a goalless stalemate for the second consecutive season chances at a premium Kennedy again from long range a good save this time by the Wickham Wanderers goalkeeper nil nil and on as even two when struggling Plymouth Argyle visited Vicarage Road two days later Plymouth in front the cross from the right and a firm header and once again the Hornets equaliser came late but came from an old familiar route he may have gone to be more defensive but when Watford have needed Tommy Mooney never once has he failed the cause 1998 began with a packed Vicarage Road a soft surface and the game against Sheffield Wednesday in the third round of the FA Cup Big Ron sat and suffered for one of his foreign legion Alexanderson gave Wednesday the lead would that knock the stuffing out of Watford the answer spectacularly seconds later Hyde's pass Peter Kennedy arguably his best goal of the season Vicarage Road erupted that Mr Taylor was money well spent before the replay against Sheffield Wednesday another trip to Lancashire and another defeat Burnley doing a Preston on Watford with two Andy Cook goals the Hornets not enjoying life in the North West and then facing the prospect of a trip to the other side of the Pennines to try their luck in Sheffield for the second time a dramatic start Paolo Di Canio and the linesman involved in an exchange and when Di Canio repeated his antics to referee Willard he got first use of the soap Watford battled but in the end it all came down to penalties Mark Pembridge demonstrating the art of penalty taking whose nerve would hold as the shootout continued Jason Lee his nerve held was there to be one crucial mistake Micah Hyde's kick saved by Kevin Pressman the pressure really on Petter Rudy scoring for Sheffield Wednesday Watford simply could not afford another miss Peter Kennedy gleefully smashed it home but Wednesday were in the driving seat Graham Hyde Richard Johnson ferocious right foot in the net if Kevin Pressman scored Watford were out of the cup
all that now mattered to Graham Taylor's men as Peter Kennedy opened the scoring against Preston the following Saturday with the league points that they hoped would take them to promotion it was a good early start again Kennedy the scorer of the first Jason Lee knocking the ball in and Micah Hyde squeezing his way between two defenders to double the Watford advantage for the second time Watford conceding a crucial goal from a free kick that just spurred them on in the second half Page and Peter Kennedy from Jason Lee's knock on 3-1 Kennedy had delivered and so to Brentford a fascinating game and a Tommy Mooney goal that gave Watford an advantage Brentford with Mickey Adams their manager in charge for only a few weeks gave as good as they got though and in the end the inevitability of an equalising goal it looked like a point of peace but that man Johnson once more providing a crucial strike to give Watford a victory by two goals to one as they headed to Chesterfield a second away game and this time Gifton Noel Williams kept his head the promotion bandwagon had become an express the hopes of the end of January though turned to huge disappointment in the first game of February Adiakim Bai his name goal scoring his trade as Watford were to learn to their cost his pace quite simply outdid the Hornets and Gillingham's 2-0 victory only Watford's second home reverse of the season it was hardly the best preparation for the match against Luton the following week Robert Page nearly causing embarrassment when his header went agonisingly wide as Oldfield steamed in but Watford went ahead courtesy of a man who'd made his debut in the corresponding fixture the previous season Watford born, Watford bred and Watford celebrator Paul Robinson even Harry joined in the fun but Luton were to get a share of the spoils Oldfield's knock on the ball cleared away, driven in and eventually it was Marvin Johnson who got the final touch to square it for the Hatters Graham Taylor didn't mix his words after the match against York whatever the view of the penalty given by referee George Kane for that challenge this was not a good day for the Hornets York City ahead from the penalty spot and with 95 minutes on the clock Steve Palmer equalised a point few amongst the Watford contingent felt they deserved it certainly was a case of Palmer rescues and so to the small matter of trying to avenge Millwall had beaten Watford at Vicarage Road and when Paul Shaw put them ahead a case of déjà vu seems to be very much on the cards but playing at Millwall seems to bring out the best in Watford Jason Lee, Ronnie Rosenthal, Gifton Noel Williams not over the line until Tommy Mooney helped himself a point and so to one of the best games of the season Bristol Rovers flying high with real playoff credentials but taken by storm by Watford early on again it was Gifton Noel Williams 
and then Ronnie Rosenthal's great overhead effort past the despairing keeper and Watford seemed to be cruising but in the second half Rovers rolled up their sleeves with the Hornets defence unable to clear the long range shot always had possibilities for Rovers and having got one back they weren't finished Barry Hales who made his name across Hertfordshire at Stevenage cutting inside one challenge brought down by Tommy Mooney with the second challenge Jamie Curtin's penalty saved by Alec Chamberlain but Curtin with the aid of a defender getting it in at the second time of asking as Rovers celebrated they thought they'd got a point Watford had been in this situation before and been rescued Tommy Mooney answered his club's call with another left foot bullet and Watford had secured all three priceless points four days later the club mourned the death of kit manager Roy Clare they also mourned the loss of three points Walsall came determined goal up at half time then Gifton Noel Williams equalised there was always a feeling as Watford pushed players forward that Walsall might be able to do something on the break and in the end a defensive mess and Walsall did get a second and match winning goal Darren Baisley had spent much of the first half of the season in the treatment room he gave Hornets fans a reminder of what they were missing with that wonderful strike at Blackpool the Tangerines back on level terms back came the Hornets again the full-time score of 1-1 did at least mean they had something from a trip to Lancashire. Two home games in quick succession followed and with Southend and Carlisle both in desperate relegation trouble people were counting on six points. And Micah Hyde's goal that put them ahead against Southend did nothing to dampen the optimism. The second half did as Andy Thompson cut through the Watford defence to get the Essex club fighting a desperate relegation battle a share of the spoils and so Carlisle came to town the following Tuesday night Micah Hyde good work in the box Steve Palmer from close range the Hornets in front urged on at every opportunity by Graham Taylor the second goal came when Jason Lee's cross was headed home by Darren Baisley but look here for the work by Alan Smart and Nick Wright of Carlisle a goal back both men booking summer transfers to join Taylor at Vicarage Road up to Lancashire again and the perfect start for Watford with this glorious goal from Darren Baisley catching up for lost time in a season of frustration for the Watford right side speedster but inability to clear cost them dear as Oldham levelled the match early in the second half and stand by for one of the season's most memorable moments Nigel Gibbs in the opposition half right footed into the net no wonder he thought he'd got a nosebleed because he'd gone so far forward and then right at the end with the points almost halfway down the M1 lack of marking and Oldham substitute grabs a share of the spoils. 
once again Watford's Lancashire luck had deserted them and against Northampton still pushing for the playoffs a lovely strike by Richard Johnson gave Watford the lead But in the second half, Northampton came charging forward. They had their own playoff ambitions. And those playoff ambitions were to be boosted by a point. The match ended 1-1. A share of the spoils. Back to Lancashire. And more misery. Wigan cut loose from the outset. And on a very forgettable afternoon... Watford suddenly found themselves three goals down. It was one of those afternoons where everything was running for Wigan in and around the area. Alec Chamberlain's parry falling straight at the feet of a Wigan player perhaps fearful of what might be said in the dressing room at half time Watford did fight back on a heavy pitch and a splendid goal his first for Watford by on loan striker Dominic Foley gave them hope the hope increased with a second goal scored by eventually at the second attempt Micah Hyde but controversy surrounding a late disallowed goal left the points in Lancashire and so to that final run in Jason Lee hit firm right footed the Wrexham defender could only put the ball past his own keeper Watford ahead by a goal to nil and having taken three points came the big game against Bristol City this the championship shootout and Peter Kennedy's strike the follow up by Jason Lee ending a long barren spell the celebrations clearly illustrating the significance of that goal and on a pitch clearly damaged by the exploits of the American football team City grabbed an equaliser that point though was to turn out to be the crucial one the new kit was on display for the first time when Grimsby Town visited Vicarage Road 12 days later Watford huffed and puffed but they couldn't bring the Grimsby house down Micah Hyde hitting the post with one effort there were just two games left Steen oh he's done it he's put it straight in from the free kick and just as Gary Clayton did when Torquay came to town earlier in the season Mark Steen has put it in Johnson looking for space down the right this is Darren Baisley the cross no Williams Lee behind him and they're back on level terms and the smash and grab partnership do enough they push forward again to some purpose Lee Slater off the post no Williams the championship race was going to the final day highlights many any particular game obviously the Luton game away from the fans point of view but from a football point of view any particular afternoon give you particular cause for satisfaction um, well I've got to say without doubt it's got to be the the last game the, the lap of honour we've done um, you know the airs on my neck stood up on end and it was fantastic for all the players uh, you know you, in your career you look for you look for highlights in your career and that for me has got to be uh, up there with the, with the best it was a tremendous night once Jason put that equaliser in it seemed as though that was the that was the trigger really wasn't it yeah that's right I mean uh, I, I think the way we started the first 20 minutes I think if we could have got a goal then and on our good spell then I think we could have gone on to win the game four or five nil without a doubt. Um, you know that's my that's my opinion. Um, unfortunately, we didn't. They got back into the game slightly, nicked the goal, um, and I think we was a bit you know surprised by that. Um, couldn't have timed it any better to get the goal to start the second half, um, and we got the winner as well. What does it mean to Robert Page that he has gone down in history as the captain of a Watford promotion-winning team? 
Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's something I'll, I'll cherish now for the rest of my life. Nobody can take that away from me. Um, you know, I, I've got that. I've got that in myself now. That you know, I've uh, I played a, a part in in getting Watford promoted um, as club captain as well. So um, you know, there's no prouder man on earth than me. The amazing thing too, though, I mean, people will look back, and I know you'll have your own particular highlights. But the afternoon against Blackpool, you had your, your young son was the mascot. That was obviously an important afternoon. And then the old man goes and does that. Uh, yeah, it was a uh, it was a good day. Uh, uh, you know, I remember I remember this uh, particular goal that I uh, you know used to probably score. I scored quite a few times in my career. You know, just uh, doing a sort of a run from uh, you know our uh, half. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a good day, uh, you know, and I think we played well as far as I remember. And uh, I obviously remember that my son was very happy that day, he was the mascot, so it was a good uh, family day. What about Graham Taylor? He must be particularly chuffed that he's got this club promoted, but I'm sure you one of the major reasons you agreed to come to Watford was Graham Taylor. Uh, yes, and I will never forget it and I will always appreciate it and uh, I think um, we have to be honest that uh, you know maybe 90% of his decisions this season uh, concerning players, uh, transfers, concerning lineup or other things were right and uh, you know, it proved to be the right decision, and um, I just I'm glad that uh, you know he's got now uh, time that he enjoys himself because you know we know that in the past uh, he went through um, you know some rough time, and you know he really deserved it. The dream that everybody set out with last August has become reality. Yeah, like I say, we, we worked very hard from the, from the start of the season. Um, promotion was our priority. Uh, we've achieved that. Um, so you could say we've set out what we wanted to do. We worked very hard. We went to Lithuania and Finland uh, for long periods in the summer. Uh, when you're away from your family, that's hard. But we knew what we had to do. And, uh, and fortunately, we've got the rewards. Some vital goals. Any one particular that brings back particularly happy memories? Well, I think the obvious one would be the Bristol Rovers. Um, 2 0 up at half time playing the best football that we have for all of the season at that time um, and then to throw it away to, to uh, two goals in the second half and then I was fortunate enough to get a chance in the, in the last few seconds I think it was uh, fortunately it went in I like say the celebration started on that day I think and you had the habit of doing it late because there was Plymouth as well wasn't there well it was I mean it happened like you say several times that if, if we uh, weren't in the lead or didn't have the result that we needed um, in the last five minutes of a game, then it, it was me who was tended to be pushed forward. Um, and then chances come. If chances come in the box, then, then I'll gladly take them. And the moment that I'm sure everybody will look back on with particular pleasure of Ed Gibbs this season, um, you recovered from your nosebleed remarkably quickly. That afternoon at Oldham, uh, you don't score too many goals, but they're all particularly special when you do bury one. That's right, I can remember all seven actually, Mike, and um, they've all been from outside the box, but th that one was it had a little bit of build-up play, and uh, obviously, you know, it was great when it went in, and obviously my celebration was uh, enjoyed by everyone, and, uh, you know, it, it was great to score a goal for, for a change. What of all the goals, if I had to say one that's given you particular pleasure, which would it be? Well, they've all given me pleasure, but I think the one on Tuesday night was a bit special, because I had played for ages, and coming back and just starting a game like that and just scoring a goal means a lot, lot to me because you know? the end of the season as well and it's an important three points because now we've still got a chance of winning the championship. It was just a case again, and not for the first time this season, that uh, you were in the right place at the right time. That must please you. Your, your positional sense has been so good on so many occasions, particularly, you know, Slater hit the post and, and you were there to help yourself. You know, that's all part of playing up front, you know, and I've had a lot of hard work from Lufa and from Ken and from the gaffer, of course like helping me with my position in work and certain other aspects of the game. And you know, it's come off, I've got 10 goals this year. And I didn't think I, I, I had confidence that I would score, but I didn't know where I'd be in the side. I've been in the side and I scored 10 goals. I think that's all right for my age, really. And to do it at the Vicarage Road end, I mean, there was a very special feeling between GN Williams and the Vicarage Road end, yeah, isn't it's, there? Yeah, it's, it's always nice to score in general, but when you score at the Vicarage Road end, it's a bit that much special because, you know, you're up there with your fans and you can celebrate with your fans, you know, so... 
it's all, it's all good really, wherever you score, I don't matter really. What particularly will stand out for you as you look back on the promotion winning season? Just promotion as a whole, you know, because being involved with the relegation a couple of years ago, it was so depressing and really upsetting, but to go well, back up two years later is just a brilliant feeling. And to have done it in some style, um, there were some wonderful performances during the course of the season, weren't there? Yeah, that's right. We were a little bit disappointed with the second half of the season, not to like storm it, but first half of the season we just um, played really well, got the good results and that set us up really for the second half. Particular days out that you'll have fond memories of, I suspect. Um, South End probably taking pride of place. The manager described it as a superb hat-trick. Did you feel as good that night as you probably ever felt in professional football? Yeah, obviously, um, you know, yeah, it, was, it was a good experience, you know, scoring three goals. And, uh, I mean, it was just, I mean, to get the ball and the boys are saying it. And, and uh, it, was, it, was just, it was just, it was just great, just a great night, you know. And, uh, um, <laughs> they were so different, say. those goals, though, weren't they? I mean, it wasn't as if you were, they, they, they were all, the, the great thing about those goals was that they weren't just tapping some tears, they were brilliantly taking goals. And they were all different. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the second one, the free kick, I mean, I, I would say it's the best goal to score this season, you know, best strike. But, uh, I mean, obviously, it was it was good to do, you know, and, um, I mean, I think the other game you want to say is the way to Luton, you know, and, I mean, on the day at Luton, it was unbelievable, 4 nil up after half an hour. I don't think I realised until, like, afterwards how much it meant to the supporters, you know, coming up and shaking your hands and saying, you know, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. so, I mean... It was another great day, you know. And one of the best days at Vicarage Road must have been Sheffield Wednesday, because that was one heck of a strike in the FA Cup. Yeah, I mean, it meant I mean, at the club, you know, getting a replay on that. And, uh, I mean, they had just scored, and I mean, Mega and Richard centred, and they'd done a couple of one-twos, it was a good move, and Mega just let it off, and I just put my head down and I hit it, you know, and lucky for me, it flew in. <laughs> Once more, it was a goalkeeper who was to lift the player of the season. The immensely popular Alec Chamberlain being given the prize trophy before the game against Bournemouth. Which began with the ultimate Mr Versatile, Steve Palmer, wearing the goalkeeper's jersey. Part of the master plan to get him to play with every numbered shirt on his back from 1 to 14 during the season. A set he was to complete with a number 9 against Fulham. This is Hyde. Again, they're queuing up in the box. Goal, Williams! Beautifully done. Hyde down the right. No Williams in the box. Fulham have got to come forward. Their playoff hopes could rest on getting something out of this game. Beardsley, one each. And the old boy shows them how. What a strike by Beardsley. On serve by Baisley. Knocked back towards Lee. He's hit it well. He's hit it well enough. And is that the goal that brings the title to Watford? Minutes later, referee Bill Burns' final whistle sparked the celebrations. The victory at Fulham and Bristol City's failure to win on their last match had been enough. Craven Cottage witnessed scenes the like of which it hadn't seen for many years. Paul Robinson, surprise, surprise, leading those celebrations. Watford were the champions. From your own point of view, the season was crowned that last home Tuesday night against Bournemouth when uh, wearing a number four shirt you received <laughs> the player of the season but um, is it something that you felt you did you feel you, you were going to be there or thereabouts you know, or you, you well, just have to concentrate on 90 minutes and then yeah, comes I, the next one you don't like to sort of uh, think about yourself really I mean it's obviously a team game and everything but it's nice to get individual awards um, the, the divisional award was, was really a, a lovely bonus as well um, but the way that the supporters were talking, you know, when they speak to you, they said that you, I had a good chance. So, 
you know, it was nice to be in the frame and obviously to win it was uh, was great. I, uh, you know, I was, I was really thrilled. How does this promotion campaign compare with some of your achievements as a, as a club manager? Well, no, it's the best one because it's the latest one and that's how you should look upon it. All of the others are stocked away in the memory bank, you know, one or two little mementos, I suppose, at home to show for them and you think about those things when your career is over. This is the best one because it's the most recent. And to have done it 12 months after you walked out on that pitch with the uh, peace in our time, <laughs> you were holding up the, the piece of paper. I wish it had been peace in our time. <laughs> Believe me, it's not quite been like that, but uh, there we are. Um, yeah, it's uh, the expectancy, Mike, was was a bit difficult to carry at, at times because I'd put myself into that position. I'd agreed to come back as the team manager. I wanted to come back as the team manager anyhow. Um, and I expected myself that we'd get promotion this year. But outside of that, it put a lot of pressure on the players, you know. I mean, people might say, well, what pressure? But it does, because all of a sudden the attention was on myself, Graham Taylor, ex-England manager back at Watford, all of the kind of things. Suddenly you've become 10 to 1 favourites to win the championship from a side that only finished 13th. And the players, you've got to develop your own relationship with them. And therefore the expectancy came on them. But it has to be that way. I mean, I think that's the kind of person that I am anyhow. I don't want to be playing in the middle of a table. I don't want to be playing for nothing. And I want people and players round about me who want and expect of themselves good things and to do well. And I think we're gradually getting this in and have got this in to the present group of players. They're aware of the situation that I'm not saying to them, you must go in the first division now get promotion. But they're already aware that next season I'm not looking and saying, well, OK, you know, let's flirt with relegation. I, I don't want to do that. I want to be doing much better things and I want players to have those same ambitions. And two final things. What do you make of this amazing man, Steve Palmer? <laughs> Yeah, old Steve Palmer. Well, I think he's done very, very well. I mean, we didn't know that it was that kind of record. And But when you have somebody that you can say, well, look, we're short there, go play there, go play there, will you play there, put that number on, they're a big asset. They're a big asset. I don't believe, you see, that people can call themselves footballers if they can only play in one part of the pitch. I think real footballers can play anywhere. Uh, now, I'm not saying that Steve has played in every part of the pitch, but he has put a lot of those uh, numbers on. I mean, Keith Millen says that it was the worst pressure he'd been under in his career, <laughs> knowing he had to win the toss against Bournemouth on that on that Tuesday night. Well, I think the players have learnt a little bit more about me, because I'm not too certain that anybody thought, well, he's, he's not serious, is he? And there are things that I was serious about. But I also felt that it relieved some of, not, not pressure, but it created a bit of a carnival of atmosphere for people. We were promoted, for goodness sake, and if we couldn't do it then, all right, when we were going to do it. And here was a chance to create a little bit of football history. What I didn't realise was how much of history it was and that uh, people immediately began to look at all the record books and were finding more and more that it hadn't been done before. So it's great for Steve. And of course, when it says Steve Palmer, and this is, I suppose, where I put the club hat on, it's going to say Steve Palmer in brackets Watford. And so the name of Watford comes into those record books again. And finally, one moment of, uh, above all of it for Graham Taylor to particularly cherish from this season. When I knew we'd got promotion, when, uh, you know, even down at Bristol City, when you know, well, that is it, we've got promotion. And that's why, as I say, some of the supporters saw me fast asleep on the coach coming back. Uh, then I could sleep and, and did sleep coming back from Bristol. Then I knew that we had got promotion. Uh, I mean, I always thought that we would get it. And I wasn't just saying these things. I was very confident that we would get promotion. I was never too certain when it would happen. When it actually mathematically happened was at Bristol City. So I got on the coach and fell to sleep. It was another fortnight. And a trip to Israel later. But a proud club captain, Robert Page, got his hands on the nationwide trophy and took it to the streets. Watford hadn't seen scenes like it since 1984 when the FA Cup runners-up came home and they turned up in their thousands. Hey, click here for more video. Hey, click. Come on. Click. Come on, bro.